everybody, this is Cameron in the edit. Just want to let you know that uh, when you're listening to this, the new edition of Disco Elysium is out. Ah, uh, yes, full voice acting, all these things. Voice actors changed. Uh, we recorded this and began recording this back in January of 2021, way before I, I think it was announced. I think these first couple episodes were uh, recorded before anything was announced, so we might have even recorded before that. So that's all to say that this is kind of a weird time capsule in some ways, too. It's our uh, responses and reactions to a form of Disco Elysium that is not the standard form of uh, of the game, which is a little bit interesting, I guess, historically now. Uh, at the end of the series, we're going to play through, I don't know if we'll play through the whole thing, but we'll do an additional episode that's just on the final cut, some additional stuff, all that kind of, of thing. But this is the, uh, you know, our uh, Mages and Murder Dads season about a game that really isn't playable in the same form anymore. So, you know, it's what if, you know, do -do 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 -do, go back in time. What if we could have recorded a season of Mages and Murder Dads? when Baldur's Gate 2 came out, like pre-patches. So, you know, experience it with that in mind. Um, we'll be talking about all, all kinds of stuff throughout this, but I uh, hope you enjoy this. There's about 10 or 11 episodes, something like that, in the series, and they are um, they're a little bit longer. They're actually double the length of a normal Mages and Murder Dads episode, so if you love that, hey, this is the one for you. And if you don't love that, then uh, don't listen to it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, enjoy it. Um, uh, the new theme song for this um, for this season is by Shogo Mike. Um, you check out their work down in the description below uh, if you enjoyed it. Okay, thanks. Uh, I guess here's the thing. Now you get to listen to us from a long time ago talking about a thing that doesn't exist anymore. That's fun, right? Goodbye! Welcome back to Mages and Murder Dads, the best show dedicated to the Baldur's Gate franchise and beyond. I'm Cameron. And I'm Danny. Danny, this is episode 65, and uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is not out yet. It's wild. That's a lot of episodes. Um, and it's not like we started this game with the launch of Baldur's Gate 1. No, we did not start this... this uh... We didn't start this in 1999. <laughs> yeah, no. This is uh, this has been going on. Uh, took a took a hiatus. We we came back for some Baldur's Gate preview stuff. Um, that's been out for over a month. Uh, the mm -hmm. early access of Baldur's Gate three, and and here we are playing a game entitled Disco Elysium. So we're we're beyond. We got on. Uh, let me. You know, let me kind of paint a picture for you, right? Mm -hmm. We we wake up in Candle Keep. You know, we got little crusties in our eyes. Mm -hmm. We got to wipe those crusties out of our eyes. We do that. We look out the window. Oh my God, what's that? It's a spell jammer. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix is on it. <laughs> Historical figure, Jimi Hendrix. And so we get on that thing. We zoom through the aether. Mm -hmm. There's a devil over there. Mm -hmm. There's a demon over there. Mm-hmm. There's an Archon over there. Whoa. There's uh, uh, John Delancey <laughs> right down there. And then we, boop, we pop right out of that into uh, a completely different metaphysical universe altogether, Disco Elysium. So that's the narrative explanation for that happen. But how, give me a tweet worth of connection on how Disco Elysium is connected to the games we've played before. Isometric RPG. Boom. There you Case go. Case closed. But maybe even more uh, to the point, does Disco Elysium exist in a world where Planescape Torment was never released? Well, probably not. Yeah. Um, so Disco Elysium came out. Uh oh, it's the police coming to get me. They 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 don't like it when the streams cross. Oh no. Um, uh, but uh, yeah. So you know, uh, Disco Elysium came out in October 2019. So about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago from when we were recording this. Although I don't know exactly when this will uh, come out. Um, but uh, it came out then, and the the general vibe. Um, and especially due to some interviews that uh, Robert Kurvitz, uh, one of the writers on the project, kind of the lead writer on the project, and one of the designers as well, uh, some of the interviews that he gave were basically like, hey, um, 
Planescape Torment is big for me. Mm-hmm. And so, I you know, I set out to make a game. This game, game took a long time to make. It was in production for a long time. This, I think, is like the third title that it had. Disco Elysium was not its original title. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, that's it. That You know, this is kind of in the vein, I would say. And we'll talk about kind of mechanics and things like that in a minute in Disco Elysium. But it is... A team pushing the isometric RPG about as far as you can push it before it breaks down. Yeah, I would say so. I think that we're really exploring the outer limits of what someone's been able to do with it. Um, there have probably been other, even wilder attempts. Those attempts uh, have not made it to my computer. <laughs> they, they are not. Not- they, they are not. They are neither notorious nor famous enough to get there. So mm-hmm. this is this is what we're left with. Yeah. The um, and you know this game won a bunch of awards. You know a lot of people uh, kind of put it in their top ten games of the year for last year. Um, and then, uh, but it also won. You know, I think it won an award at the Game Awards. I believe um, sold lots of copies, did really well. So uh, you know, this is a game that's like sticking around mm-hmm. for for a minute. And so you know, it kind of you know, maybe to pull the curtain back a little bit for as far as candidates for mages and murder dads go, right? I mean, I think that there's probably um, you know, in the universe of things we could cover, it could be Pillars of Eternity. Mm-hmm. It could be um, Arcanum. We've talked sure. about that. Um, and then Disco Elysium. You know, those are kind of... The, and maybe Tyranny, I guess. Tyranny. Is the other, yeah, the other kind of one of them. But, you know, there's not that many options uh, or not that many directions we could go. And I think you and I were not super excited about doing another hyper-crunchy, um, you know, combat-focused game. Well, I think that... I think what we've been about in choosing our games... And I'm, I am happy, even though it uh, prevented me from playing, psychically prevented me from playing video games for a full calendar year. I'm happy we did Torment, colon, The Tides of Numenera. Uh, because I think that that game was taking taking ideas from Planescape Torment, which is, I think, some one of the most um, satisfying stories I've experienced in a video game. Really taking the ball and running, seeing where they could get to, you know? Mm-hmm. Um I'm interested in kind of feeling for the edges of this space. And maybe after we finish this game, uh, I don't know when Baldur's Gate 3 is is coming out. I think I might feel okay visiting like a uh, Pillars of Eternity. But I think that I'm interested in kind of the new experience in the envelope pushing. I think that the Pillars of Eternity and even maybe the Tyranny are games that feel maybe more like homages than, than games really trying to trying to figure out where the edges of these of isometric RPGs are. Yeah, there, you know, there, there was kind of, oh, we've talked about this already, right? But Pillars of Eternity, Tyranny, all those games, Wasteland to a certain degree are, or Wasteland 2, I guess I should say, are all games that, that came into being because they were specifically kind of, you know, uh, pu- you know priming the pump of nostalgia. Mm-hmm. Um, and Disco Elysium, and you know we're going to figure out if we think it works or not. And we're going to we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But it, it's at least doing something different than that. You know, it's it's taking the bones and building something different as opposed to trying to deliver the Baldur's Gate feel for you again. You know, yeah. and I and I think uh, you know, in some ways, it's pushing harder than even something like Baldur's Gate Three is doing, which is still a little little bit of a nostalgia romp. Mm-hmm. But you know what? We don't have to fucking justify our decisions on this on this show it's true what are they gonna do (laughs) turn us off please don't turn us off we cease to exist the moment Mm -hmm. you close the window yeah it's bad Mm -hmm. it's just there's just a void out there (laughs) yeah uh much like the way this game opens well how about that that's (laughs) that's 65 episodes right there (laughs) that's 65 plus hours of practice at transitions mm-hmm. wow we but yeah so so um i guess we should say before we talk about the void right um, oh there is a character creation of sorts uh in of this game isn't there there's a character creation but i wanted to say something about mm. uh kind of the big scope of the thing right so mm-hmm. um i've played this game before and you've played this game before yeah you've played it in the past six months or so and i played it back when it came out mm-hmm 
uh, about a year ago. So it's fairly fresh in my mind, but we'll talk about how fresh um, mm-hmm. uh, in the thing. You know, fresh enough um, probably is a good way of putting it. But um, it ha- it's it, at its core, it is a mystery in some ways. Yes. And I... I mean, tell me if you agree, we haven't talked about this, but my assumption is, much like the other games, we are not spoiling the mystery as we talk. Yes. Okay. We did not open Baldur's Gate 1. Spoiler alert. This can't be a spoiler alert. This is episode 65. We did not uh, open this and be like, hey, you wake up in Candlekeep. By the way, you're the ball spawn. You're not going to figure that out for for 12 hours, but uh, (laughs) whoops. (laughs) But whoopsie doodle. We no, didn't name mages and murder dads, though, so that mm-hmm. might have given uh, it away. In any case, um, I agree with you. We are not going to, we are not in the business, despite the fact that this is a uh, mystery that we're going to unravel, we are going to uh, use our brains and imagination to regress our consciousness to the point when we didn't know the mystery. Mm-hmm. That's how exactly. I'm going to do it. Yes, uh, I'm not going to do that, but um, I will not spoil the mystery. So kindly, please, in the comments, do not spoil the mystery. Um, and <laughs> um, and yeah, we're going to kind of proceed through this, you know, as if we don't know and, and kind of walking through each individual choice and things like that. So, uh, yeah, just uh, oh, I, and I guess the sorry, the whole reason I'm saying this is that if you haven't played Disco Elysium, that's OK. Because we don't assume that you have. So you should be fine. If you haven't listened to Mages and Merger Dads before, if you're coming in just for Disco Elysium, there's like a whole bunch of other games we've talked about already too. You can go back and check those out. But yeah. spoilers on that ball spawn thing. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, but yeah, we start in the void. Uh, but first we create our characters. Uh, what'd you do? How'd you do this? Well, there are some presets you can select that I glanced at and then immediately went to the custom option. Because, you know, I'm special. Mm -hmm. And uh, preset characters do not encompass my being. They don't fully capture it. Um, But I created my own character. And this is a game. There are basically uh, two choices you make during character creation. You adjust your abilities. The four abilities in this game. uh, It's not like Dungeons & Dragons where you have the, the classic six. There are four intellect psyche physique and motorics you want to tell us kind of what those are about some of them are more obvious than others yeah it, intellect is like um thinky skill right mm-hmm. so logic is in there uh, and we'll talk about these like I, I guess skills inside of them i don't i don't know what they're actually called yes the different kind of dividers um and uh so you know it's your ability to think about the world. Um, mm-hmm. Psyche is kind of like sixth sensey kind of stuff. Um, so it's uh, you know so things like um, oh gosh, let me let me pull it up. Yeah, I can. So on the on the intellect side, there are six kind of abilities. I don't know what the what the correct term would be, but there it's actually signature skills. So I think they're individually skills. Yes, skills. Um, and uh, there's the, so you kind of have the raw attribute. Each attribute has six skills associated with it. Intellect is logic, encyclopedia, rhetoric, drama, conceptualization, and visual calculus. Yes. Yeah, I've, I have now pulled it up. Mm-hmm. Um, what do we have for Psyche? So Psyche has things like volition, inland empire, empathy, authority, esprit de corps, and suggestion. So these are all kind of like you know, empathetic. Well, empathy is literally one of them, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, feelings. Kind of ex- yeah, feelings and authority is in there too. So they're like almost positions in some ways. Both authority and the spirit decor is like their um, social, like, yeah, positionalities toward other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you know, it's yeah. I guess social. This is kind of uh, as close to like the charisma um, thing. Mm-hmm. You know, in traditional D and D, I would say. Yeah, it's charisma and wisdom wrapped yeah. into one another yeah um intellect is very much just intelligence in D D. that feels very kind of intelligence but 100%. it still has but there's still like a tiny bit of charisma in there with things like drama and rhetoric mm-hmm. um 
Meanwhile, you also have physique, uh, the six things being endurance, pain threshold, physical instrument, electrochemistry, shivers, and half light, which is your physique, but your hailness, your hardiness, your raw physical strength. And also we're getting into just your, um, so like your, there's like a, there's a raw physicality way in which you interact with the world that has a little bit of overlap with, uh, psyche. So, um, volition and and uh half light for example volition is the psyche thing about just the force of your will half life is almost it's framed as your fight or flight response yeah it's like uh half light is your uh your film noir ability yeah <laughs> right you know it's like uh you know you're down and out in the gutter and you know who can pull the gun fast enough on the ground like that's that's half life and yeah. shivers is like you're standing in a doorway and you and you think there might be someone behind it but you don't know yes um, and your body tells you right so mm-hmm. there but, is a it's kind of almost like there are these feelings that you can that we all get in real life and i think the feelings that kind of happen in your head are psyche and the feelings that happen in your body are physique. If that yeah. I, mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's a good way of putting it. And and you can tell, right? Like, you know, we're trying to put these in the terms of like D and D stuff, but um, you know, uh, specifically the, the ability scores, but obviously, you know, these are in conversation with that, that, you know, this design team looked at that and thought, no, 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 that's insufficient. Right. We yeah. need to deal with this other stuff. And I think they've come to some cool, I, I think these are really cool divisions uh, in the world. It's an interesting way of kind of splitting things up. But uh, we also have uh, motorics here. Yeah, so motorics, um, em, uh, emblematic of the skills being hand-eye coordination, perception, reaction speed, savoir-faire, interfacing, and composure. So... Hand-eye coordination. So we're, we're. I'm thinking from coming up, coming from Baldur's Gate. This is the dexterity one, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Th- this is basically Matorix is like wisdom and dexterity kind of crammed into each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when faced with all these uh, skills, we, we we talked a little bit about the kind of characters we were interested in making. I wanted to do something a little different from my first playthrough. I have six points in physique, four points in motorics, and one point each in intellect and psyche. Just complete wow. dump stats. Wow. I am a I did, force of nature. I did not go that hard uh, in my... <laughs> I, I think my lowest scores are twos. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think I've got, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that I've got um, uh, four, four, two, two. Mm-hmm. Um, that, yeah, that adds up, right? Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, so I've got four in intelligence, four in psyche, um, and then two in the other two. Um, just, you know, some safety stuff. But, but my plan is not to add additional points. Uh, to those skills and we'll talk about the level ups or maybe we can just talk about it now so when you level up in this game you're you're never increasing as far as i know your initial ability scores you are leveling up your individual skills yes and your individual skills um unless modified by those level up points or by equipment which we'll get into later are basically equal to your attribute scores so Mm -hmm. because i have a six in physique all of those physique scores start the game at six yeah 100 Mm percent. and so you can see there's a little bit so you know here's the thing not jumping too far ahead but you open this game with amnesia yeah and so i think actually we should probably just say balthazar and ticklevar it might be balthazar and ticklevar um i think that there's going to be a slightly uh different take on balthazar but i think it's kind of like a parallel version of balthazar mm-hmm. right like the, just kind of the the raw physicality is there but obviously uh, we're going to be inhabiting a character with history in the world in the way that balthazar is you know 
<laughs> blank slate <laughs> emerges mm-hmm. from, you know, fully formed. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so yeah. Oh, also, there's one other choice. So the first choice you make is setting your skills, and the second choice you make is choosing a signature skill. Yeah. And what signature skills do uh, is they do two things. One, they increase that one skill by one. And they also increase the maximum skill uh, of all of the skills that share that attribute by one. So, uh, for example, I have a one in intellect. So there is a hard cap on how many points I can put into those skills. And I think it's just one. I can put one additional point and I will not be able to improve past that. Whereas mm-hmm. I can put like six more points in endurance, for example. Uh, what what was your signature skill? Uh, endurance. Um, Got it. Endurance, cool for fighters who can take a hit, uh, lookouts who don't sleep, human batteries. So just someone who can just in, endure tremendous amounts of uh, of of hardship. Yeah, we had a conversation. Obviously, we had a conversation before we uh, played this, right? To kind of split these up. And purposely, we're splitting this up as much as we can into like two very different play experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but as you were saying, right, this is a game that is really heavily narrative based. And so, you know, there are a lot of pre plotted story beats that you just kind of move through. Um, and you know, we split up these skills or these abilities so that we could have truly different ways of moving through those same story beats. Cause otherwise, you know, you, you could have a world where our two playthroughs are very different, very similar and things like that. Um, but also because we both played this game before we knew that, uh, there would be certain ideological choices and we'll talk about the thought cabinet in, in just a bit, but, um, the decision that we've made, because this game offers you uh, several opportunities to like be a shitty person, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of discussion when this game came out about like good, bad, does it work, does it not work? I've written about you know does it work or does it not work, and uh, so we have made the, the I've made the choice. This is how I'm playing the character, mm-hmm. um, uh, my Chicklevar here. So my signature skill is logic, and I'm going to be a a good cop Mm. like a logical thoughtful trying to figure out the case by the book cop Mm. who is also a racist Mm -hmm. but good cop great cop Mm -hmm. huge racist Mm -hmm. um and and the reason i say that (laughs) if you're not familiar with the game that was kind of a big discussion uh when it came out is that the game allows you to just play to role play as a racist and uh, I didn't do that when I played the game originally because I didn't want to experience that. But I feel like in the sense of, uh, or in the spirit of the Mages of Murder Dads kind of trying to figure out the full length of the thing, we're going to see what, that, what the game, uh, how it handles that, how it's written. And if, if we think it's good, if we think it's bad, or not good or bad, but if we think it does something uh, interesting or important with the way that it talks about race or thinks race. Um, I'm going to say already after the first um, uh, you know, two hours or so of the game that I've recorded, no, I do not think it does anything <laughs> interesting with that. Um, okay. But, but it might over the course of the game. And I'm open to uh, figuring it out and kind of taking the game on its own terms as far as what it's trying to do and say around some difficult uh, topics. Mm-hmm. So uh, so that's that's how I'm playing the game. Do you have any kind of big pillars that you've thought of yet? Yeah, I think that from my... I, I've kind of had this idea of I am this physical force of nature. I have... Um, I, I think that the character I am playing is not capable of admitting that he is wrong or and, and also lacks any kind of insight about how his actions like affect people. I don't know if Balthazar has like a strong uh a strong ideological perspective on the world just yet. I think that Balthazar is just kind of moving through the world mm-hmm. as as pure ego. So kind of like a meta libertarian. Yeah, a, a bit of a meta libertarian. <laughs> I think that I I, I think that um I, I am purposefully kind of avoiding dialogue options where in which I show any kind of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we start in the void, huh? <laughs> yeah, we start in a in a in a void with a creepy voice. Oh no, I'm in a Guy Ritchie movie. 
<laughs> Truly an oh no. <laughs> oh, you don't no. want to be there. You don't want to be there. You're going to get shot. Um, yeah, so in this, um, you know, the right-hand side of the screen, you know, normally in these games, in these itromestric, <laughs> oof, <laughs> isometric, mm -hmm. <laughs> here we go. Um, I recorded for like a long time last night too, so my voice is a little, a little scratchy. Yeah. Also, when um, we were rushed, so you weren't able to do your normal fifteen minutes of saying "Wind Spear Hills." Yeah. Normally, I do recording. a lot of warm ups beforehand. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the opportunity today, but um, yeah, we uh, we're in this void, right? And normally, in these isometric games, the chat panel comes up from the bottom of the screen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it kind of comes up and um, takes up about the bottom two thirds or something like that. You know, think about the Fallout games, think about Baldur's Gate, think about all these other ones. And I, I think that people at Studio or not, I'm sorry, I don't think it's Studio. I think it's just Zalm. Um, <laughs> the, the people at Zalm uh, who made this game, I think, realized that that box that takes up the bottom of the screen worked really well in a four three aspect ratio, mm -hmm. but perhaps does not work as well in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And so their chat panel comes from the side and gives you kind of a square on the left side of the screen where you're seeing things happen. And then you have this chat panel that takes up, uh, you know, two thirds of the screen to the right. Um, but black screen, chat panel, and we get two figures talking to us, two kind of void entities. Yeah, and, and I think that the balance of those two figures really, how much they participate in this opening monologue question mark mm -hmm. um it really depends on kind of the choices you make but the first one we encounter is the ancient reptilian brain mm -hmm. um which uh is basically being like man you don't have to do it you don't have to do anything there's just blackness here buddy mm -hmm. non-existence he's talking like this mm-hmm uh. mm-hmm um, and then, uh, then the limbic system shows up <laughs> only at the very end for me, because I'm like, yeah, I'm fine with darkness. This oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. in this conversation. Yeah. So you're really getting to make choices here. And I kept being like, no, I think I want to wake up. Mm, I think I, I want to exist. Staying asleep. I think I want to exist. I think it would be good to exist. Mm. And yeah, that ancient reptilian brain kept going, no, you don't want to exist. And then the limbic system showed up. I was like, you want to exist? And limbic system's like, oh, you feel your flesh. Oh, it's awful. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's pain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, you um, you wake up. Well, actually, I guess in this conversation, we already get a little bit of characterization, or I did at least. Um, because I think that there is a brief mention of... Wait, is ex-wife? Did you say something about an ex something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the yeah the ancient reptilian brain kind of says immediately for me, hey, you don't you probably want to stay here in this void and not be alive because uh, you got an ex-wife out there, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, you don't want to wake up and they say the world of light and pain. You don't want to do that because there's an ex-wife out there. Mm. So you already there's already this kind of noir you know, vibe to it, right? Um, I think that's the genre where ex-wives show up the most. Yeah. Probably. And just, uh, look, if, if there's anything Majors and Murder Dads is about, it's about bad, sad dads. Oh, and we're already funny. just thrown into the body of a bad, sad dad. Yep. Whether um, whether he's like sired offspring or not, this is a bad, sad dad. Yeah, an ontological uh, mm -hmm. bad, sad dad. Um, but yeah, and so, you know, I think that this is the first instance of many instances in which uh, maybe genre and intent run into each other a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's some real kind of programmatically... Not interesting. I would say stuff that happens around women in this game. Sure. Um, that that we are going to have the opportunity to talk about throughout the rest of the thing. But I chose to wake up, and I'm assuming you were forced to wake up. I was. I was at the very end, and we are met with. I would. I would call this. I think that. Uh, I don't know whether it will end up being a conic, like an iconic in the um, in the grand scheme of video games, but a real sight. Of the opening scene of this game as as we as we awaken. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are crumpled on the ground uh in tidy whities Um and uh and in in our in our little work socks in just an utterly trashed 
hotel room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you do? <laughs> I'm not now playing Dungeon Master. What do you do? <laughs> uh, I, I look around. <laughs> uh, can I see my feet? No, so uh, you're like... So you're this dude, right? Mm-hmm. You're this, like, bearded, balding, white dude. Mm-hmm. And uh, you are in these tidy whities and I walked around and picked up all my clothes. Yeah, that's... Uh, I think first thing I did was reach for the ceiling fan. Well, I know... I've played this game before. Mm-hmm. So I know a little bit about that, but why don't you... Because there's a ceiling fan, it's... Flu- flipping around in the sky, you know, mm-hmm. doing what ceiling fans do, and there's a tie hanging from it. Yes. So, yeah, what's up with that? So the first thing I do is I turn the light on, and this is the first, um, I guess, kind of check that my character undergoes. I pull the light bulb on, and um, and there is a. Uh, pain threshold check uh due to like the sudden burst of light and, and the fact that i ostensibly i am incredibly hung over mm-hmm. um but i'm able to i'm able to work my way through it i don't take any damage but i think that this is an automatic check once you do it and if you fail it you will take damage and and i'm gonna nice little opportunity to kind of elaborate on the system your health You have two health bars in this game. You kind of have Mm -hmm. your physical health and you have your morale. Those two uh, numbers are completely determined by your physique score for your physical health and your psyche for your morale. So if you start the game with a single physique, with one point in physique, you will die immediately. (laughs) You will die and then you will go to a game over screen and you will see a little newspaper clipping describing your body being found in a hotel room. Yeah, and this happened to me the first time I played. <laughs> I I had one pip of health, mm-hmm. and I reached for this stupid light switch and died. <laughs> how, how did that feel? It sucked. Mm. It was. It didn't feel good. It didn't feel interesting. It didn't. I did not. Uh, uh, you know, giggle in self realization. I just mm-hmm. thought this is bad. Mm, I, I, that happened to me the first time I played it, and I, I liked it. Even though it is uh, it is really annoying because it does not auto save. You no. have to just create your entire character again and do the initial dialogue with the limbic system again. And that was the thing too, I guess, is that for me the n- initial time playing it, I really hated it because I thought, well, this is really constraining my choices as a, as a player, as a you know, in creating my character because. My assumption after that point was that this is the game telling me I might need more than one pip of health. Um, and so I put an additional point in physique so mm-hmm. I could get some, you know, some more health. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I wasn't all about it when it mm-hmm. happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's what I did. Also, there was a tie on the, uh, on the fan there. I used my, um, my hand eye, no, maybe not my hand eye coordination, maybe my uh, savoir faire, and, and snatched it off of the blades of the fan. Yeah, you know, and what's interesting about that? So you're, you know, this is how the game works in a broad sense, right? The there are situations put in front of you, and then the game presents checks to you that you can voluntarily choose to do or not. Mm-hmm. And if you fail those checks, you have to wait till you have increased that ability score in some way to come back and do them. Mm-hmm. For the most part. There are so, some small circumstances where it doesn't require a level up, where maybe if you change the material circumstances of the situation, such as maybe like turning off the fan before you try to snatch the uh, the tie. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, w- what's interesting, and, and I don't think we're going to run into that too much here, but over the course of the game, there are places where one situation, depending on how you've built your character, will prompt to different types of check. Yeah. Um, so there's like totally different ways of solving certain scenarios. So we'll see if that happens here. It might actually happen here. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, our primary thing here is who who are we? Mm-hmm. This and, is very. Um, oh, let's run through it. Planescape mm-hmm. Torment, Baldur's mm-hmm. Gate Two, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> Torment: Colon Tides of Numenera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we're getting a very. 
a very similar experience to the anonymous protagonist as those other games. Yeah, uh, you know, what can change the nature of of, uh, of a, a balding man in his 40s? <laughs> what can change the nature of a cop? Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so I mean, the, the, this whole thing, right, is... Uh, so I guess what we have to do is we have to figure out where are we, right? We're in some sort of fictional world. We don't really know much about it yet. Uh, we mm-hmm. haven't gotten some sort of big info dump. Uh, we got to figure out who we are, and then we got to figure out what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. Really, all the parts of a newspaper article. <laughs> yep. We got to figure out how we got here <laughs> and when it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily, we do know when it is because there's a little timer uh, on which things are happening in the bottom right hand of the screen. Boy, this is, uh, and this is important. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it is a little timer. It is not tracking with real time as time passes or even in a dilated sense. As you do little tasks, as you have conversations, as you part- as you like maybe do events in the game, it will increase small or moderate or even large amounts in some circumstances. So it is basically like a little meter. Imagine in- if instead of the timer, it was, or the time, because it's a little clock. Imagine if instead of a time, it was just a meter on the side of the screen that was like amount of stuff you can do before it gets dark right Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. kind of like how this functions in the in the in the game so we're definitely going to be like interacting with that and i can tell it's day one at the at the beginning of the game here Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you've collected all your clothing Mm -hmm. probably only one shoe only found the one shoe so far do you head into the bathroom yes i went into the bathroom to discover it's called the look or something like that Yes, the expression. The expression. Um, so you can you can wipe off the like kind of steam from the bathroom mirror, and you can see what is called the expression, which is like this look that your character, the Ticklevar and Balthazar, are making right now. Mm-hmm. And you can attempt to like remove it from your face. It's like this like leering grin. It's terrible to look at. Truly. And you can react to it in different ways. Uh, you can kind of like muse to yourself, "What is this?" And you can mm-hmm. be horrified at it. You can be like, "Oh yeah, I'm a superstar." Uh, you could say, "Is this me trying to like attract?" members of the opposite sex it, that's literally an option um and you can attempt to stop doing it which even though i have like six in uh and like physique which is the check being required here uh i was unable to do it dang mm-hmm. it's in, uh, it's like try. categorized as impossible it's an eight percent chance but even in what you're saying, I think you can get a good sense of like the tone of this game, right? There's this kind of meta textual kind of, uh, you know, I, I hate to use the word, but this kind of ironic stance toward everything mm. um, of <clears throat> being able to kind of deconstruct like what is the expression and, you know, how does it work? And being able to often the choices you're making are mental choices in the game, right? This is kind of like choices in your character's um Train of thought. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, headcanon about the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, but they're all, I mean, generally, they're all kind of meta stances toward whatever thing that you're looking at, right? So um, do you go for this kind of meta stance about, uh, you know, sexual attractiveness? Do you go for this meta stance about, like, trying to remove the expression from your face? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the other option is this is the face of a late-stage alcoholic. He, he, and so this kind of brutal realism about it too mm-hmm. um so but yeah i mean we'll talk more about choices i guess as, as we go through but but they're different i think than the largely dialogue based choices of all these other games that we've talked about you're not often in this game you're not really choosing a thing to say you're choosing what your character stance towards something in the world is Yes. And at this point, have you in kind of moving around your apartment, what's the first point where you have a skill kind of interject and tell you something about the world? Because that's also a very different way that this game kind of works. I think it's probably at the the electrochemistry, maybe in front of the mirror. Yeah, maybe so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, I don't maybe not. I don't know. I I can't think. But yeah, often basically what's happening is in between choices that you're making in the game, uh, there are kind of these auto checks going on in the background, Mm -hmm. uh, checking against your skills, your various skills. And I'm assuming those are tiered in some way. So 
you know, if you have a higher electrochemistry, it's going to tell you here as opposed to like if it, you have a logic and it's going to tell you here. But so the skills that you have chosen to level up and skills that you've chosen to lean into have um, uh, they tell you passive information about the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, because I have intellect um, and I have the, the encyclopedia skill as a part of that, I get a lot of like info dump stuff about the world due to the encyclopedia skill kind of. Uh, paying attention to the like proper nouns that people are saying and then telling me about what those proper nouns mean. Yes. Another example, which I think that you definitely had this, I think this is automatic for everybody, um, is once you think about looking in the mirror and wiping it off, Inland Empire will interject and say something like, abort, you, you have not thought this through. You do not want to see what you are you will never unbecome what you see um yeah so yeah. it is literally your skills having a conversation with you attempting to sway you yeah and, so, and the way that this kind of thinks of the player right or, or the, i guess the player character is that in all these other games in the lineage of Baldur's gate you know the the character is just you right yeah. it's arbitrary for the most part like you can choose whatever you want for the most part in dialogue, you are not constrained by previous choices. I mean, in Planescape Torment, you are, obviously. But in Baldur's Gate 2, you can be a huge jerk 99% of the time and be really nice at the end of the game. There's, like, mm -hmm. no you know, no uh, punishment or reward for doing so um, because the outcomes are mostly the same. Um, as opposed to this, right, where the, the character is really a composite of the choices that you're making and then the choices you have made uh, as far as what skills you've put points into. Yeah. And they kind of lead you down certain pathways and they're kind of their own presence in the game. Mm -hmm. Like you start to recognize like uh, not in this playthrough for me, but I had quite a few points in Shivers the, la the first time I played the game and Shivers just starts telling you things about the world. Yeah. Um, you know, about like secret stuff in the world or about things happening somewhere else in the world that you just have a, you know, a feeling about. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so it becomes its own kind of like narrative device. But, you know, I think we'll start as we get into this game, uh, particularly after this play session. I think those things will really start kicking in once we have a lot of points into those uh, different abilities. Well, you, you find anything else in this uh, in this trash department that's worth noting? Um, there's a tape player or, or like a reel to reel tape player that Got is, ripped up. <laughs> yeah, it's smashed up. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I got a little quest for like figure out what's up with that with music mm -hmm. uh missing one shoe obviously we've only found one there is yeah. a uh our windows smash though um so i think the first thing i do after i leave the apartment is go on the balcony right outside the apartment you can find your other shoe right there i did not do that oh no so you're just walking around with uh yeah. one shoe yeah i did that the first time i played the game too i think i played 90 percent of the game with one shoe <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh and yeah and all your clothes are like disco clothes um, yes and they all have different uh all the the clothing items for well for the most part most of the clothing items in this game have some sort of ability um or, or skill boost to them yes um so uh and so and you can collect new clo clothing items i collect quite a few over the course of this play session and uh they start changing the kind of composite of your character too. So, right, there's nothing, I, I think, a big argument of the Disco Elysium, you know, game system is there is no essential player character. Um, you know, you can com you can compose the player character in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And clothes are a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, going outside and we meet a lady. We meet someone who we end up knowing is uh, Klasia. Mm-hmm. And this person is just kind of, I think she's maybe smoking a cigarette and mm -hmm. she puts it out and, uh, and greets us as officer. Yeah. She kind of gives us a bunch of different info about like, what's up. So she says, uh, she calls you an officer. So, you know, and I kind of have a conversation. I'm like, I'm a cop. And she's like, yes, you're a cop. Um, she tells me that she says, I've been here for three days. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I've been drunk basically the whole time and just smashing things and breaking stuff. Yeah. I um, I inquire about the events of the previous night and she's able to say, oh, 
there was earlier in the night you were playing really loud, kind of exuberant, joyous disco music. But at the very end of the night, um, in the kind of the wee hours of the morning, maybe you switch to this very sad, almost church music, like hymnal type music, organ music. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seemed like you had a breakdown. You started yelling about how nothing matters. And uh, then you, you, you know, she heard a smash, and the music stopped. So there's that. <laughs> Dang. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does she tell us about the corpse here? Um, I can't remember. Yeah. So uh, you do ask. She says that. Well, you did say that. Um, you did say that you were on official business. And then I responded, well, what kind of business did I say I was on? And she said, um, well, I, I don't know. You've mostly just been, you've mostly just been drinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think my favorite, uh, my favorite uh, moments were when I was trying to like ask, hey, what year is it? And she's like, well, it's the it's the current year. And I said, well, what number year is the current year? And uh, her response was just, well, years just have names. And this is the, this, you know, this is 50. Oh, it's 51 of the current century. That's right. Mm -hmm. And centuries don't have numbers. They, uh, they have names. And I said, well, how many centuries have there been? She responds, uh, civilization has existed for 8,000 years. She grins, and I say, what's so funny? And then she responds, uh, you're right. There is nothing funny about civilization. That's, this, this is really, uh, I think, hitting a lot of the notes of the tone of this game. Yeah. In this first conversation we're having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll find out more about where we are in all of that. I mean, this is not, uh, this is not a spoiler in any way, mm -hmm. but... We learn a lot about the geopolitics of this world. Yeah, we are going to... We, and you really... You start from nothing. You start yeah. from absolutely nothing. We know that it's year 51 of the current century and that there have been 8,000, you know, years. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to start from that and we're slowly going to build up our understanding of the world around us. Yeah. Um, and that involves... She goes back to her room, mm -hmm. and you can go downstairs mm -hmm. to the cafeteria. What's called the cafeteria. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, what we what in a hotel for us, you know, in the United States, we, it's like the bar area, like the hotel bar. Yeah. Um, and um, I, just to, to shortcut a little bit, because we're going to come back to these characters quite, o quite often. There are three characters who are here for us to meet. Mm -hmm. um, one is Gart, the the hotel manager, the cafeteria manager. I'm sorry, he's very cafeteria. insistent. Yeah, and he manages many cafeterias. Three, but he <laughs> later he says many. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is Lena, uh, the cryptozoologist's wife, mm -hmm. who we really don't learn much about at this point in the game. She immediately says, "Hey, you need to talk to that buddy, that friend over there, your buddy." Yeah. And then Kim Kitsuragi who mm -hmm. is your uh, backup, basically. Mm -hmm. He is from, you're from the 40th precinct? The 41st. 41st. And he's from the 50-something. 57th. Great. I did not write these. I'm glad you wrote these things down or you remember them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, well, let's, let, basically, when you talk to Gart, just a really short cut, because, uh, again, we're going to come back to him later, but he basically says, hey, you've been here screwing things up forever. Yeah. Uh, you know, for like three days. Three days. Um, the person, uh, you're here to uh, uh, investigate a corpse that is hanging from a tree in the backyard of this hotel. Yep. Um, the person, and I said, Do you, did you call the cops? I mean, you know, like, can you give me any information about it? And he says, no, a, a woman named Sylvie called the cops, but she quit. And so that's why he, why Gart is here. Mm -hmm. uh, because is, Gart would otherwise not be hanging around this place because he is the cafeteria manager mm -hmm. and he manages many cafeterias mm -hmm. and he would not be here um uh and so basically he says you know you owe him some money uh you you owe him like 115 um is it real real yeah real um 
And uh, so he basically says, hey, you can't sleep here tonight. Basically, you can't end the, the game day. Um, yeah, that you have that conversation after actually after you talk to Kim and Kim wants to mm-hmm. talk to Gart with you together. Yeah. Um, after you do the interview, you are given that information about, I think it's 130, and it's basically your bar tab plus the hotel stay plus the damages to the hotel room. Yes. Um, you start the game, I think at this at the point I'm talking to him, I have 40 real cents. Yeah. That's less than right. one real, so I'm, I'm quite a far way away from settling up my tab. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I think you're meant to look down at that and be like, "Oh shit, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like, how, how am I going to come up with any money?" But I, but I'm shortcutting all that Gart uh, just so we can have a little bit more time to talk about Kim Kitsuragi, everybody's favorite bomber jacket wearing sidekick. He he's great. Well, so that's I think an important part of the game is mm-hmm. that is Kim Kitsuragi a sidekick? Mm. And I don't think so. Yeah, so I think that, well, in terms of the way the game works, Kim's Kim's doing a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, we, as the players, and we, as the character who has this kind of alcohol-induced amnesia, uh, don't know anything about the world. And Kim is there to tell us stuff about the world. We don't know how to do our job. Kim is there to, at least in the beginning phases of this game, to kind of give us suggestions on how to do our job. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kim also is just kind of the prompter of this is the next quest. This is the next thing we need to be doing, especially during these the first episode or two of this uh, of, of our show, of, of this series. Um, he's going to be the one driving us to be like, no, this is the next thing we need to do. Yeah, he's he's kind of the the guide rails mm-hmm. uh, to to make sure you're on task at the beginning of the game. But uh, you know, he's not your partner. You know, long term. You know, he's not like your uh, you know assigned partner at your precinct, right? No, he's been beca- called in specifically to help with this investigation. Yeah, because uh, I think that the the cover, at least here at the beginning, is uh, it would appear that whatever event has transpired is in some way cross jurisdictional. And so you are here on behalf of the 41st. He is there on behalf of this other, uh, the other precinct, the 57th. And the other thing I guess that we get that's implied here, and we get a lot more information about it throughout the game, is that the police, we are in a place called Revachol. That's the big one, yeah. Yeah. The and then city. the actual location we are in, the kind of couple city blocks that we're in, is... Martinez, mm-hmm. and M- Martinez is a place where the police do not go. Yeah, it would seem we're 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 told pretty early on that uh, the dock workers union, more or less, police and kind of in quotation marks and in, and not in quotation marks, police this neighborhood. Yes. And, and kind of this whole region, and we don't get a, a huge amount of information about why, but we do over the course of s- several different things uh, mm-hmm. in this episode, or, or things that I went and like looked at, and things I learned in conversation. You know, this is a kind of a post-communist, well, well, I guess like post-imperial, then post-communist, mm-hmm. and now kind of post-invasion, like liberal invasion, mm-hmm. um, uh, liberated um city and then this specific place has somewhere that's been just kind of abandoned uh over the past 100 years question mark yeah Um, so the timeline i don't even think i have much of a timeline established at all as of uh kind of where we end mm -hmm. um this this episode and that's going to slowly as i start as we start talking to more figures Mm -hmm. uh that's going to become increasingly clear but i think your general outline of it is correct this uh area is quite dilapidated it's quite beat up uh when we walk out of this hotel we are going to see the ruins of a bombardment campaign Mm -hmm. Uh, the city streets are in some places going to be blown up so yeah i think that there was a time when there was uh, a king 
The king was overthrown by a uh, by kind of a communist or left wing group. I, I I don't think that they're called necessarily. I think they they're communards. Yeah, they're called are, communards. Mm-hmm. Um, then there was a uh, a reaction force, and I think in, in fact uh, probably a global kind of reaction against mm-hmm. the the revolution. Um, but we're going to, we're going to be kind of filling things in and there's just a few, I, I think in conversations it's going to come up and it'll, it'll hopefully clear things up. Yeah. And, and what the kind of sketch that I just gave there too, basically comes from a couple conversation pieces that, you know, just kind of show up passively. And then I went and looked at a statue of, uh, the emperor or the final emperor, old sumptuous Philip. Yes. <laughs> For Philippe, maybe. Um, which is a uh, it was a statue that was blown up by the communards, and then some quote unquote designers uh, reconstructed it in this kind of hyper impoverished neighborhood uh, many years later as like a, a conversation point or a critique point of uh, you know um, uh, you know, I, basically putting up this this statue of this ancient ideological imp- imperial figure as like commentary. Um, and the, the game's pretty side-eye critical of, of doing that. But, mm. um, you know, this is just kind of historical stuff in the world that gets built up in conversations. I think what's important just to kind of flag here is that there's not going to be, at least to my mind, over the course of this um, game, there's not going to be one character we talk to who gives us the full complete picture, the kind of God's eye view of, like, what's up in the world and the history of this place. Um, despite the history of this place being super important to the general plot. Yes. And a matter of fact, not only is there not going to be a single character, if you weren't particularly interested in it, or if you were role-playing a character that was not interested in the history around them, you can kind of just move through this game and finish this game without ever, un- without even really understanding more than what we've just said. Yeah. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of, I think, just for the the use of the reader and for or for viewer listener, I guess, in the use of us, there's going to be some kind of reconstruction that we have to do, much like what we just did a minute ago. But that's kind of all we know, right? Mm-hmm. This is a place with, with a deep history that's undergo- undergone some political changes, uh, some s- s- significant political changes over the past couple hundred years, maybe, or maybe past 30. We really don't know. and But that has ultimately left it in a state of... of um, kind of impoverishment and destruction mm-hmm. where the union is the biggest power and the state, you know, and the police is a part of the state really do not have a lot of, of direct power here. Mm-hmm. And so we are a cop in, in that situation. Mm-hmm. We're a cop and our, in our very first um, kind of interaction with Kim that gets filled out a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And I think that in this first conversation, uh, Kim asks us some questions. Kim's like, oh, I kind of missed you on Saturday. guess I also <laughs> missed you on Sunday, too. So now it's now fully uh, it's now fully clear. OK, we're on Monday. Kim has been trying to meet up with me for the past two days. Yeah. Um, and uh, so <laughs> Kim's like, OK, well, have you mapped out the initial interviews? And uh, I think I respond, uh, I, you're, I, that's right, I'm police. That's true. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I had a, the exact same. <laughs> this is when I decided I'm going to try to be a real police here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to go for it. You know, okay. I'm not a McNulty. I'm a Lester Freeman. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, uh, yeah, I just, I was like, yes, I've done all these things. I've mm-hmm. done the interviews, of course. Oh, I I did say. Oh, I I haven't done them. So I'm a. I know I'm a policeman, but I am also. I'm like, yeah, I haven't gotten around to it. Then how did you respond to? Have you removed the dead body? I, I said no. I haven't yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you just know. no. Um, I I haven't done. And uh, Kim asks, "Hey, do you um, do you have your badge, right?" Mm-hmm. And what did you say? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I also said yes. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely have my badge, and the game okay. is pretty clear that you do not have your badge. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, the I, I guess one thing to say about Kim Kitsuragi too is that um, you know this game doesn't take place in the real world, as as we you know should 
should probably be pretty clear. You know, there's no planet Earth here. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't really have any sense of the cosmology or like the name of the planet or anything like that. There's kind of not a planet, weirdly enough. But um, the uh, the thing that's important too about Kim Kitsuragi is that you know, for our real world equivalent, he is uh, of Asian descent in some mm-hmm. way. And, but his voice acting is kind of uh, like a French accent, I guess. Yes. So um, we kind of we we have two. We we kind of have the the visual references on his descent or heritage, but we also have he has a different accent. Um, and it, and it, and it seems like that accent. We're going to meet other people, I think, in this game that kind of share that accent that uh, perhaps denotes like uh, in a, in a shorter uh, span of time, like kind of where he's from in Revachal, or or you know even where he is in relation to Revachal. Yeah, accents in this game and um, in uh, kind of like the things that they care about or the things they talk about really kind of uh, denote um, uh, regionality. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of kind of discussions of regionality, but I just want to flag that here because you got to remember, uh, my character is a racist and mm-hmm. that's going to come up later. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and other people, you know, I, th- this game is pretty open about other people, uh, being confrontational with you about things that people are confrontational about in the real world, uh, like race, class, uh, job, things like that. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Do we want to talk about our first most uh, confrontational character? Oh, go for it. The Kuno. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, we meet with Kim. We go to Gart. Uh, By by the way, I just want to back up. So when you say, um, when you say, uh, yeah, so I haven't removed the body yet. So Kim's like, so it's been sitting there for (laughs) a week. It's been there. So basically, it's been there for four days before we arrive. So a murder happens. It's there for four days. I get here. I burn three days. Yep. So it has now been rotting behind this hotel for a full week. We go to Gart. Gart tells us about our bill, etc. We leave the hotel. And if you go to um, kind of out behind the uh, the hotel, y- we do meet a very confrontational uh Figure who utters the first, and matter of fact, I think only word in this game that is censored. Yeah. In the uh, first line of dialogue. Yes. The the Kuno is a little kid. Mm-hmm. He's like an old like a 12-year-old. Yeah, somewhere in there. He's somewhere. He's like a preteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and he's throwing rocks at a corpse hanging in from a tree. Mm-hmm. And he keeps calling us the F slur. Mm-hmm. Repeatedly over and yes. over again. It's awful. Or mm-hmm. they're just an awful little jerk of a child. And the way it's censored is like uh they insert static when the yeah. voice actor says it, and otherwise it is just a, a like when rendered in text, it's like an F with a bunch of asterisks after it. Yeah. So he keeps doing that and he will over the course of uh many dialogue options repeatedly uh uh, insult both the player character and Kim Kitsuragi. Um, but, and the but, corpse. And the corpse, it's true. <laughs> and he's being kind of um, egged on by uh, another kid who's hanging out on this fence named Kuno S. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is kind of um, yelling at him mm-hmm. um, and and uh, getting him to be rude. Mm-hmm. But this kid has spent multiple days, it seems, throwing rocks at this corpse in the tree. Yes. And how our does job this go? Is to investigate this. Yeah. How does this go for you? Talking to the Kuno. So, do you talk to the Kuno? Because when I uh, first like talk to the Kuno, uh, Kim tells me that's a force you don't want to mess with. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my the, my electrochemistry like informs me pupils dilated. He's sweating. Kuno's high. Yeah. Uh, the implication is that Kuno is on methamphetamine. Yeah. There is some kind of he definitely under the influence. Maybe I, somewhere between the ages of ten and twelve. Not Kuno, yeah. Kuno. Kuno might be quite young. I can't. I can't fully 
peg it because obviously it's very abnormal behavior that, that mm-hmm. the kid is exhibiting no matter what. But yeah, so I actually don't engage after Cam advises me not to. Yeah, I think maybe I don't either. I mean, I think I have the short conversation that mm-hmm. that you're kind of pushed into there, but um, I'm trying to look at my notes. No, it doesn't look like I actually went through that full conversation tree with the Kuno. So I think I did the same thing as you did. I kind of walked over to the corpse. Oh, I guess the other thing I'll say is that you might be thinking, dear viewer listener, it's weird that there's a preteen on methamphetamine in this game. Hmm. Um, I think it, this game gets accused a little bit sometimes of a little bit of edgelordism, you know, hmm. a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, if you don't like it, you're, you just don't understand the conditions of the real world, man. Um, you know, that kind of vibe. And, um, I mean, I think it, it goes for it, you know, I mean, it's, it's saying that, you know, this, this is a poor kid in a messed up area of the world and he does methamphetamine and you just got to deal with it. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think we can be critical of that, and I think that we're going to talk about the Kuno um, several times over the course of the game, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I tried to get the corpse down and immediately barfed, and uh, <laughs> and uh, Kim told me to uh, get my shit together. <laughs> in which, uh, at that point, I was introduced to a thing called the Thought Cabinet, Ah, uh, yes. Where I can uh, learn a skill called shit compression yes. in order to get my shit together. Mm-hmm. So the thought cabinet is a parallel with the leveling system, which you're just going to kind of get little experience points here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, when it when the bar fills up, you get to put a point into one of these skills. There is a parallel system that tracks with time past. Where basically you can dwell mentally on a subject and have breakthroughs. So as you are introduced to concepts, ideas, events, circumstances, you can choose to select one of those things to dwell on. Some, like the shit compression, I think is like half an hour. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's another where I started thinking, wait, where am I from? And I believe it was while I was in the hotel and thinking, oh, well, maybe I should just go home and not pay for the hotel. And I realized I didn't know where I was from. So I am working on in my thought cabinet, trying to remember where I live. Mm -hmm. And I've got another one in my conversation with Gart. He tells me about um, the woman who left, whose name I said before, and now I've forgotten. Um, Uh, Sylvie or something. Sylvie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that he was disappointed that she quit because he was quite attracted to her. And uh, I got a thing called inexplicable uh, feminist agenda. Ooh. Um, that was like, hey, you're her boss. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't try to date her. Um, and so I got an additional thought that that I could kind of work through in my thought catalog. And so all of these things are produced. And also I think we're going to talk over the course of this about you know things like inexplicable feminist agenda. Um, Mm -hmm. although I think the implication of this, once you learn it, is that at one point before you lost your memory, you were a feminist, but you don't know why you believe these things. You just do. Um, but again, we'll talk about that, but, Mm -hmm. um, all of these are the byproduct of situations or thoughts that you encounter over the course of the game. And when you equip them to begin learning them, right, to begin mm-hmm. kind of imprinting them in your brain, they give you certain benefits, and then when they, or, or it, well, certain benefits and certain um, drawbacks, drawbacks, yeah, and then when you complete them, they they have slightly different benefits and drawbacks too. Yes, exactly. So I'm working on the trying to figure out where I'm from. I never got the shit compression because I am so hale, my endurance is so high that I did not vomit. I was able to I was able to to withstand the the stench of the corpse. Wow. So what does that look like? What do you do there? Well, I just uh, I I say, you know what? Just like stand there. Don't hold your nose and breathe it in. And I was able to just kind of stand my ground, breathe it in. And then the uh, it kind of opens up a new way of examining the corpse by kind of subject. Look at its head, look at its boots, etc. Yeah, I it took me probably a full hour to get to this point. Oh wow! 
So did you have to like, okay, you failed. Did you have to like get some smelling salts? Yeah. So when you, when you fail, um, you know, Kim says, Hey, get your shit together. Mm -hmm. And so then I went and talked to some people. I just kind of walked around and talked to people, Mm. um, for 30 minutes of in-game time. And then, which uh, is like two conversations or so, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I went and talked to Gart again. And then I talked to, um, the, uh, gardener who's hanging out in front. There's a, uh, uh, like a dark skinned woman who's a gardener. I was talking to her a little bit. And so, uh, Kim also suggests that you get some, uh, I think, alcohol or no, ammonia. Mm -hmm. And then you try to apply that. So I went back, you know, I got shit compression going on. I went back with the ammonia and I tried to the check again and I still failed. Mm. And it was like, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. And Kim's like, yeah, maybe you should just like walk around some more. (laughs) (laughs) It's the game being like, you need to level up or something, right? You need to put some skill points into it. Yeah. And so I end up, this is a long way around because so I actually ended up doing everything else that we planned to do for this episode. And then at the very end, getting the body down. Wow. Okay. Um, but so what I ended up doing is I talked to the gardener. I got her gloves. Mm-hmm. Her gloves give you a plus one to endurance. Yeah. I ended up going to f- Freet, the like 7-Eleven store that's mm-hmm. down the block. You can buy a raincoat that increases your endurance. I got a raincoat. I put the raincoat on. And then I put one point into... Um, uh, fortitude or whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, the 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 skill to make you more hail, as, mm-hmm. you, as you were saying, and then after all of that, I was finally able to meet the check and get the body down, or to mm-hmm. investigate the body, like you've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Damn. So yeah, it took me the whole. I did everything else we talked about for this episode before I did that. So basically, before so there is step one: mm-hmm. be able to withstand the stench to examine mm-hmm. the corpse. At which yep. point you can begin to that that's the first gate. You can begin to examine the corpse. We find out a whole bunch of information actually about this corpse. Kim takes a picture of it with a fancy gadget, like a Polaroid esque camera. Mm-hmm. We're slowly beginning to learn that the technology in this world definitely looks different from ours, right? Um, yeah, it's mm-hmm. like nineteen. 19- like 1930s technology, I would say. It feels almost like, uh, it feels retro in mm-hmm. a way. Like there's definitely like VHS tapes and like there's a lot of like tape. So nothing's gone digital. I think that's like the big thing. It's I, I, But it feels almost in some ways a little bit, I don't know. It, it, it's got its own take. I don't think that it's steampunk. It feels very kind of retro punk. Yeah, I I mean, I think it's like 1930s, 1940s, because there's no computation, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Um, And and we'll get some more information about that later on. But yeah, basically, computers just never happened. And so everything is, like you're saying, reel to reel, uh, you know, film, things like that. And so this Mm -hmm. Polaroid camera is like really impressive. Yeah. Uh, And he actually tells us that he only has two uh, little like uh, he only he can only take two photographs, basically, is what he says. So. We, you know, take the picture, we examine the boots, and the boots are very interesting because they appear to be made of this incredibly expensive, uh, you know, resin plating uh, that Kim says was probably four years of a police officer's salary um, Mm -hmm. for for those kind of, uh, for that kind of equipment. So Kim kind of hints that... uh, the, the initial field interviews said that this was supposedly a private security guard that was killed in a uh, a labor dispute, like a strike breaking type situation, mm-hmm. and that the uh, the dock workers are suspected. So very very strange that a security guard would be able to afford such uh, material. Mm-hmm. And uh, we we also see things like um, the the tattoo and whatnot. There's also an option that I had to just ask the corpse, who are you? Which nothing happens because I have no uh, psyche ability, right? Where Did you get anywhere with that? I had the option to do it, but I chose not to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting about this game in a general sense is that, uh, like we were talking about earlier, if you, if you go for something and it doesn't work out, you miss your check. Um, you have to level that ability up or whatever until if later. it is a white check, you can mm, you can yes. then level ability to retry. There are some checks that are red checks, which mean you're only going to get one shot. 
exactly. but those are rare. Um, and so, so I didn't want to, I, I, when I played the game the first time I was pretty, I was playing it like you would play a Planescape Torment, right? Like mm. bottoming out every conversation tree in every single angle. And that mm-hmm. actually locks you out of some stuff. Um, yes. people remember what you asked them about, uh, and it changes their disposition toward you. Mm-hmm. And so I've been very careful in this playthrough to really go for the things I'm interested in going for. And then stopping conversations before I bottom out a lot of the stuff. So I have that option. I think I still have that option at this point, and mm-hmm. I am waiting until maybe I've leveled up a little bit. Interesting. Um, so I did use it. I've locked myself out of that one. But then ultimately, after you examine the corpse, um, you we are faced with the issue of how are we going to get this corpse down from a tree? It seems to be... Uh, tied up with this uh, kind of uh, high strength uh, strap that is uh, metal laced. It's like yeah. an incredible industrial strength. Like yeah, it's like a cargo dock. strap for yeah. um, for hanging cargo off of helicopters, basically. Yeah. Um, so like so, entire shipping containers. Exactly. And so you can so like immediately right, you can understand that this is a different. Technolog- technological world than, than we live in. Mm-hmm. Um, just to go back a little bit, it's interesting. I got so much more out of this investigation of the, the hanging corpse. Mm-hmm. Did you get more stuff from this, or is this all you got? No, that's about all I got. Tattoo, um, lividity, uh, but just like briefly, and it's basically Kim talking about it. Um, I looked a lot at the boots, but that's about it. Did you get more stuff out of your intellect? Were you able to like figure yeah. more stuff out? Yeah, so I got, um, I also saw this tattoo, and he's got this kind of um, star constellation tattoo over a huge chunk of his his torso. Mm. Um, uh, Yeah, I got the serial number off the boots. Mm. Um, I got, um, I got, I understood how the boots were made. Did you, did you get any of that stuff? Uh, I did see that they were like little plates. Yeah, it's like little platelets that are built like a tree, the inside of a tree, and so they're able to shift force back and forth across them. Uh-huh. And so Kim and I were able to have this conversation where he was like, yeah, it would take a huge amount of you know blunt force to get through this armor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if someone was wearing, he only has the boots on now, right? Someone has stripped the rest of his body of the armor, but it would be extremely difficult to wound or harm someone in this armor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we're dealing with, you know, in the crime, initially we were dealing with some sort of like extreme, extreme force. Mm. Um, yeah, the lividity um, of the body uh, suggests he was like standing up when when he was killed. Um, and w- what else uh, do I have here? Um, yeah, and it was assumed to be politically motivated because of the, the union strike. Um, mm mm-hmm. But that's, but that's all I got. But yeah, we got several um, uh, like numbers off of the boots in order. And I'm assuming we can call those in, I, although I haven't yet. Yeah. So did you look at the footprints? Yes. So I tried to. And uh, and I said, oh, what's 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 I, there's a visual calculus check. Mm-hmm. I had a 17 percent chance to succeed. I failed and had a mental breakdown. And oh. quit and quit my job as a police officer because <laughs> you only have one point of morale. Yes, got it. So a uh, no setback. And actually, it was uh, <laughs> I would have had some magnesium, which is a anti anxiety pill. I suppose I can take um, to take the edge off. And so that's kind of like your morale health potion, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did have one from before, but I was trying to open the dumpster with a pry bar, and it was too <laughs> difficult. And I like exerted myself so much, I I was so disappointed that I was like in the danger zone of having a mental breakdown. So I took a pill, and then I immediately went to the footprints and looked at them and failed, and then just like oh, I can't do anything, and just like crumpled into a into the fetal position and quit my job. Yeah, because yeah, normally, you know, I, I think that's a big difference between Disco Elysium and these other games, right? Normally, you just you would lose the game for losing hit points, but here you can quote unquote lose the game from losing your ability to open a dumpster. Yeah, and, you're and, yeah, you're in the same way that you die when you um, lose all of your health, you have a heart attack or what have you. Uh, when you lose all of your morale, 
it no longer makes sense to keep because you're you're on a job you can just quit yeah you can just quit being a police officer you can just leave this area um and it is your morale that is keeping you doing your job um yeah so i was able to use the visual calculus skill um Mm -hmm. and i was able to to make that work I didn't write down the exact number, but I believe... Eight what, pairs of footprints. Yes, eight. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are a whole lot... Basically what happened is that... And the reason you're able to see this, you might be thinking, you know, dear, um, uh, dear viewer listener... A hey, hobbit lay here. <laughs> you, a, a hobbit walk here, in fact. Um, <laughs> but that would be incorrect. Uh, but the other thing, too, would be... It's been, a, it's been a full week, so like, what's up? And Kim Kitsuragi asks a very similar question. And the answer to that question is that uh, the last warm day, the last above freezing day, was the day that the corpse was in the tree. Hmm. So all of the footprints that have that were there when, uh, or you know, the people who were involved in this crime, they're all preserved because they're frozen in the mud. Mm-hmm. And so we get eight pairs of footprints. Um, what, what's interesting about those footprints is that one has a boot that is, um, extremely worn down on the right side. The right Mm -hmm. boot is extremely worn down. And so Kim floats a couple ideas. It could be uh, a driver, you know, someone who's driving a truck all day, uh, and the accelerator is wearing down their, um, their, their shoe. Another option could be someone who, who, uh, operates like a drill press or a lathe, so, you know, mm. they're on the pedal all day long. Um, and, uh, you know, these are cool you know, kind of crime solving ideas. There's another set of footprints that are very small that, that could be either a child's or like a, like a small woman's footprints mm-hmm. that gets floated in adolescent. And then there's another set of footprints that are so deep that they would be from someone who weighs more than 200 kilos. That's a lot of pounds. Yeah, it's a lot of weight. And so mm-hmm. the... Um, there's a conversation that happens between the player character and Kim where where the player character can be like, well, yeah, that was someone carrying the corpse. And then Kim says, well, why would one person carry the corpse? Why, if it's a bunch of people who are involved in this, why didn't they just like make a stretcher or share the weight or whatever? Why would it be one person doing that? Hmm. And then uh, that's a big question mark. So we don't know. Um, but I think that's all that we learn from those footprints. But that's a lot of information. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I would have uh, had a mental breakdown. So sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> how did? Um, oh, how'd you get the corpse down? Right. So it's this this big strap that, like you were saying, has metal interweaved into it. So it's super strong. Mm-hmm. Um, and you got to figure out how to get it down. How'd you do that? I told. Uh, so you can float a bunch of ideas. And the first one I had is, well, look, I've, I've, uh, Kim, I went to your car, your very cool uh, sports model car. Mm-hmm. Out in front of the hotel, and I grab the pry bar and the and the wire cutters and just get up on the get up on that branch wire cut. Mm-hmm. And he actually, you can't, I can't, I couldn't do it. He talks you down. He says, "No, that's you know, there's no easy way to get up the tree." Um, I think that would have been my first choice if like I could have gone for that check or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I say that. There's a really funny dialogue option where you can say, well, we need to we need to call the police. <laughs> we need to call somebody. We need to no, we need to call somebody. And Kim's like, you mean like the police? And you're like, well, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, nope, that's that's us, buddy. That's we're We're the people. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, ultimately, I said, Kim, let's let's shoot this this guy down. Yeah, I think I have not heard of anyone doing any other method to do this. I think that you can also, if you really fail at this method, you might have to ask the union to help help you get oh, this body down. Yeah, okay. That makes and and Kim did say because remember I did this all the way at the end of like a couple hours of gameplay. Mm-hmm. After you fail this enough times, or not this part, but after you fail the like getting close to the corpse enough times, mm-hmm. Kim says, "Well, you know, we don't have to do this today." So you you could do this later on in the game, presumably with more skill points or or whatever. So, but yeah, I also went for trying to shoot it down, uh, and I know this can go a couple different ways. Um, I'm assuming since you've got uh, Matorix, you should be able to do this. Yeah, that's right. Kim, 
I, I said, hey, I can do it. But then Kim took the shot anyway. Hmm. And while Kim was doing it, I was able to see, kind of analyze his stance. And ultimately, my assessment of why he misses is he just doesn't have the eyesight necessary. Kim's wearing glasses and, and actually at several points kind of talks about his uh, his vision. Yeah, and I think I had some sort of psyche-oriented uh, check that happens here that actually says the reason that Kim can't hit it is not actually because of his eyesight. It's mm-hmm. because he believes he can't hit it because of his eyesight. Mm-hmm. That his eyesight might not be as bad as he believes it is. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah. So Kim misses, and ultimately my hand-eye coordination like tells me after he misses, like, you can make that shot. Um. And I was able to make the shot. So I I tell him, hand me the gun. He says, what, you don't have a gun? I did not respond. I am not acknowledging that I have lost my badge or my gun. Um... I, I, well, we'll, we'll get to it. This, yeah. He already knows I don't have a gun at this point by the oh, time okay. I do it. Okay. Um, um, due to so something else. He hands it to me and I, I make the shot and, uh, and the corpse comes down. Were you, at, were, how did, how did you get the, uh, the corpse down? Yeah. Very similar deal. I was actually super encouraging of Kim. Um, I've decided that my, that my character really likes Kim because Kim's a good cop. Mm. And so we're going to be like a super team. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, I'm like, yeah, do it, Kim. You can do it. You've got it. And he takes a shot and he misses. And, um, so I tried it. Do you know what your percentage to make the shot was? It had to be pretty high, right? It was pretty high because I've got a four in Matorix. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know the percentage, probably like in the seventies. I think it wasn't a sure thing. I think it was like 72. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, so so he takes the shot, he misses, and I say, "All right, let me let me try it out." And I do it, and I close one eye, right? Because you have that option. I close one eye. I like phase out the Kuno, who was like yelling at me the whole time, mm-hmm. calling me rude words. And I have a twenty eight percent chance to do it. Lord, and I, I just did. checked, and it, I had a forty two. So it was really a coin flip for me. But that's twenty eight percent's bad. Yeah, twenty eight percent, very bad. I succeeded. <laughs> that so this game is not using XCOM math. No, it's not, and I think <laughs> it probably is doing a little bit of math trickery. Mm. Um, in that, uh, you know, I wonder if is twenty eight percent a real roll, or is that just a representation of something that's balanced much higher than that? In order to give both of us the feeling of like, dang, I don't know if I'm going to make it, and then you do make it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't know. I would assume that this game is pretty savvy based on how savvy it is about a lot of other things. I would assume it's pretty savvy about manipulating player expectation to, to mm-hmm. its benefit here. Um, I, I haven't read enough interviews about it. Basically, when this game came out, I read every existing interview with the development team that, mm-hmm. that happened before it came out. Yeah. Um, in order to kind of write about the game. But then since that time, I haven't read very much. So I don't know about the kind of system design at the bottom. So something very interesting happens. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that happens right after you shoot the man, the hanged man down. Mm-hmm. And he falls, he falls to his knees first. And my eyes meet him and I get Inland Empire, which we haven't really talked about. But Inland Empire is big conspiracy energy. Yeah, right. I mean, it, you know, it's literally a reference to the David Lynch film, yes. Inland Empire. So, like, mm-hmm. what what are the things happening b- behind the scenes, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, uh, think about that diner scene in Mulholland Drive, right? Like, yeah, what what's the re- what's the world behind the world? What is uh, yeah? At what frequency does the does reality truly vibrate at? Yeah, exactly. Um, and Inland Empire, I get an easy success. This is one of those automatic things happening in the backgrounds. What's really funny is sometimes you'll get a failure. And so like, uh, um, for example, uh, you could have a failure like perception. Yep, everything seems perfectly fine. That's an example, <laughs> like skill check that could happen. Um, but Inland Empire says, looking straight at you, helpless, trapped within itself, and I automatically respond, who killed you? Mm-hmm. And the hangman responds, communism. And then I snap out of it. Yeah, I had the same thing happen. <laughs> Wild. Yeah. 
Um, so we've got that, and you know, I you know, big question mark, <laughs> what the hell's going on with that? Mm-hmm. But yeah, then the body is on the ground, and you're able to um, you know kind of make a proper. Um, well, actually, no. So I didn't. the The game opens the opportunity to have like a proper autopsy here. To like yes. really go through it, and that's where I stopped. Mm-hmm. I did. Th- so I ha- I'm going to guess what you said. You can say one of three things once the body falls down. You get 70 experience, which is probably enough to level you up. Mm-hmm. You need 100 experience per level. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you can say, "How did I do that?" You can say, "Who's laughing now, you little shit?" Apparently directed to Kuno. Mm-hmm. Or you can say, "You've been policed." Mm-hmm. What did you say? I think I said, uh, "Who la- who's laughing now, you little shit. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I thought really hard about you've been policed. You've been policed. Because, um. uh, because in lots of conversations at this point, I can mm-hmm. say, I am the law <laughs> is, my, is my only response to things. Um, and All I've because doing- you have a high authority. Exactly. Mm. So I say, and I think it probably is uh, also the more cop stuff you say, the more cop dialogue options open up to you. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually messed up during this playthrough um, where the game is asking me my copo type. Um, So what kind of cop are you? And Mm -hmm. and it offers you all kinds of different ones like sad cop and and things like that. And I clicked on sad cop and I realized like, oh, I want to go through the rest of these dialogue options to figure out what the other ones are. And I said, I was able to click, I've changed my mind. And then the game took that as you, like, you don't want to choose a capo type. Um, and so I'm hoping that that has not been locked off to me at this point. I don't think it has been. I think okay. you're, it's going to revisit you. Um, because there are also other circumstances in terms of th- this is another uh, thought cabinet thing that can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, where if you start doing, if you start saying a lot of like left wing stuff or stuff that is, uh, sympathetic towards workers, um, communistic thoughts can, can emerge and you can try to stuff them down. But if you keep making those choices, it'll revisit you and be like, are you sure about Mm -hmm. that? So in any case, yeah. So we shoot the hangman down. Uh, I have a cool aces high aces low moment with Kim. Mm-hmm. where I give him a high five and I have a choice after the high five to go for the aces low, uh, where, where you put your hand down, and you kind of behind your back have mm-hmm. to complete it. And for a second, he's almost going to leave me hanging, but he doesn't. We, we complete the aces low and I gain a morale. That's interesting. I didn't have the opportunity. I, I did the high five. Mm-hmm. These guys hand up. When I met Kim the first time, I didn't shake his hand. Ooh. And I've also, been, well, it, by this point, too, I've, ar- I've already done some things to make Kim probably not like me very much. Mm. Um, and so I wonder if, because this game is tracking your kind of relationship with Kim. Yeah. Um, you know, that's its own kind of score going on in the background that you can't see. And so I've already done some things to really kind of screw that up. And so I, I had the opportunity to high five, mm-hmm. but, uh, and I could have left Kim hanging, too. Oh, interesting. But I chose not to. I wonder if, so there's the first choice, which is the high five, and there might have also been like a hand-eye coordination or reaction speed check Mm. for the aces low. But I have to imagine the things that you may have done to piss Kim off might be episode two, right? Nope. It's, it happened in this episode. Oh. Uh, Yeah. Um, So, yep. Uh, well, so this is the last thing I did in this one, but we had a couple other things planned for this episode. Um, what else did we have here? Well, we planned to maybe, so initially we said, yeah, so there's some, there are two little side quests where you can report your gun and badge missing, but Mm -hmm. I've got to admit, I think that the canon for Balthazar here is I am never going to admit I've done anything wrong. (laughs) Well, I did. So I did do this. So okay. I, I can talk about it briefly. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, so I, you, you got to go to Kim's car. You were talking mm-hmm. about his like cool sports car that he's got. Um, and you can get those tools, which I didn't get those tools out. Um, and, but then you can also use the radio. And so I use mm-hmm. the radio to do two different things. I use the radio to call my precinct and report my badge and gun missing. And then I used it to call Sylvie. Yes, Who's, I also called Sylvie. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, so reporting your badge and gun missing is rough because I'd already told Kim that I had my badge. 
<laughs> and so as I'm, I'm like calling the precinct and I'm like, I need to report my badge missing. Like, this is just what's up. Cause that's what Kim told me to do. He was like, you know, if anything is missing, you need to let everybody know. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, Oh, actually I think it's during this conversation. Cause I was like, yeah, my badge is missing. And then, um, you can hear everyone you work with roasting you over the radio. Yes. They're like all shit talking you, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, about you to each other, and you can hear it. And it's just like real rough stuff. Like clearly, they keep calling you super cop, and you know, it's hard to know if that's ironic or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, or or if like you literally are a good cop, you know, outside of your anonymous capability and so Mm -hmm. they're just really roasting you about this badge and then they're like oh do you lose his uniform too and then i had this option to be like oh my god where's my uniform (laughs) (laughs) and and then i had to be like oh actually that might not have been here that might have been with the kuno because i was whoever it was with i was able to be like well kim is not wearing a uniform and then internal in my brain it was like Kim is clearly choosing not to use his uniform. That's different than not knowing where your uniform is. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that's a hundred percent true. But mm-hmm. so I'm doing that. And then in this conversation, they're like, oh, and I guess he also lost his gun. And then in my brain, I was like, oh shit, where is my gun? <laughs> and so I had to be like, yeah, I also am missing my gun. Mm. Um, but I got some quest experience for doing that, which is mm-hmm. good. Um, and it was really just, it, it's an opportunity to, to hear like, all the other people in your department and like how they treat you and what your relationship to them is. And it doesn't seem like it's a healthy one. Yeah. In a general sense. Um, then I talked I, to Sylvie. Oh, I think that, yeah, I'm, I haven't reported it. It's really going to be interesting to see. It might be that just delaying this is going to make this problem much, much worse because I think that eventually in this game, you're going to have to come to terms with, some of these things being missing. And I, I wonder like how that's going to affect like the dialogue you have with Kim after I've been <laughs> lying about having these things. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but you did talk to Sylvie. Did talk to Sylvie. Um, that was a little bizarre. Uh, you definitely, I definitely got the impression that Sylvie left because of me, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't apologize. I kind of just, play dumb so um chickle var is very much like anytime that he can apologize he's apologizing Mm -hmm. um you know he's trying to do right by people you know he's trying to be a good cop he's trying Mm -hmm. to like be like oh shit i really did go on a three-day bender and like that's messed a bunch of stuff up so but that's not me Correct. Yeah, so it's kind of like Ticklevar is no i'm a good cop this was this was an aberration or maybe balthazar uh this might just be Balthazar's normal speed. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so no, I I was like, yeah, you know, I'm really sorry about that. Like, I don't know. I literally do not know what was up and why I would have done that. Um, and then she really explicitly says, like, yes, you're the reason I quit. I actually like Gart quite a lot. Um, and we kind of walk through it. And it's pretty clear. I mean, I really like that the game allows you to apologize. And then she is pretty clearly like, I guess I accept your apology, but that doesn't mean it's better. Like, mm-hmm. you, like I still, I had to quit my job because you were so awful. And she's talking about like how aggressive you were. And, uh, eventually, um, the thing that made her quit is I ripped a bird off the wall and smashed it on the ground. Like Which I just, the bird, bird that Gart was fixing when we come down the, uh, yeah. the stairs. And so uh, she says, well, look, will you please tell Gart that like, I didn't quit because of him. I quit because of you. And so you have that option to go, do I go tell Gart that and make him feel better? Or do I not tell Gart that and, you know, just, you know, fuck it. Um, but yeah, in the, in I the, didn't get any of that. I just got the fact that um, I get some information in terms of I thought that it was Sylvie that called the police. But Sylvie clarifies, no, I didn't call the police. Like the only people that even have a functioning phone is uh, is the union because everybody else has kind of stolen the copper wiring. Yes, and also, and she says there's actually a phone over on the coast, mm. that's the, or that's the other piece I got from that. And so, if someone did call the cops, it mm-hmm. might have been from that telephone. Oh, interesting. So mm-hmm. I think that can kind of fit into the case somewhere. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's kind of what she, what she gives me. And I I ultimately went and chose to tell Gart that it wasn't his fault and uh, to go from there. Mm, okay. Other stuff I did in this episode. Yeah, what did you do to piss Kim off? Uh, I talked to the racist lorry driver. 
Okay, so I have not talked to the racist lorry driver. So I did two things. So I... Um, and this is... It sounds like it's because you failed that endurance check, so you had to, like, kill time in order to get this... get Approach the body. A hundred percent. That's exactly mm-hmm. what happened, right? So I ended up... I So there is a strike going on. We're going to talk about this a lot next episode. But mm-hmm. there just the, the shortest version is there's a strike going on at the dock that's, like, at the harbor that's right here. Mm -hmm. And that strike means that the road is completely filled up with uh, truck drivers who are trying to either pick things up or deliver things. And so they're just hanging out. So I talked to a couple of those people. Um, This is when I looked at that statue that I was talking about earlier. Um, And I also went to Freet just to see what was up, which is like a 7-Eleven, like I said. Mm -hmm. Um, In the 7-Eleven or in the Freet, I saw that... um, there is a raincoat that you can buy. And I thought, oh, that raincoat might help me out for this corpse thing. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to figure out how to make money. You only need four real to do it. Mm. Um, and then I found out you could pick up cans and recycle them in order to get 10 cents per can. So I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. So um, I did a big chunk of stuff here, just walking around. And I, I went and found a, a plastic bag and equipped it to pick up cans to recycle mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is like a thing you can do in the game. Yeah, um, to make money. But the racist lorry driver, who is literally named racist lorry driver, is, mm-hmm. is standing outside, and he says to Kim, the first thing he says to Kim is, uh, welcome to Revishal. And Kim immediately gets this, understands that this is a racist dog whistle, right? Yeah. That this is uh, uh, this uh, white dude um, who is, uh, you know, quote unquote, Revishal native. Mm-hmm. And uh, saying to someone uh, of Asian descent, or, you know, fictional in-world Asian descent, welcome mm-hmm. to the country. Mm-hmm. And Kim is very quick to be like, my, he was like, my family has been here for hundreds of years. And then we were from, he says we're from, an, uh, you know, 800 years ago, we were in an isolationist nationalist country, and then we immigrated here. Um, so he kind of gets into it, but, and he really kind of gives it to this uh, racist lorry driver. And because I'm playing my character in such a way, and because I'm trying to uh, kind of feel out the system and the way that it works, uh, this game giving you the opportunity to not just be like an evil asshole like you can be in other um, isometric RPGs, but to specifically have an ideology of racism. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, well, yeah, maybe he's got a point, you know? And we kind of go down the thing and... and uh, Kim is, you know, giving it to this racist uh, lorry driver, and the lorry driver uh, shuts down until I open back up to him, and then he starts talking about basically like the Great Replacement theory, you know, in different terms. Whoa, uh, yeah, and and is talking about basically clash of cultures argument, you know, the uh, you know uh, Bush years uh, to separate cultures that just cannot coexist, and that they will ultimately. Um, you know, kind of fight one another for supremacy, cultural supremacy. And then he's talking about like that culture will get uh, infected by, uh, you know, these immigrants and things like that. So, and, and which is very much this kind of shadow in, in the real world, you know, the cultural Marxism argument that, that mm-hmm. kind of goes on around the right wing. So immediately this character who gets flagged as a racist is uh, in this first dialogue where you allow him to talk about those things is going for, like, the greatest hits of real-world, you know, um, racist arguments. Pulling no punches. Exactly. Um, Uh, Which is, I don't think, I haven't talked to him yet, but I think I'm probably going to do the same thing just to kind of draw a distinction between Ticklevar's experience here. I'm probably going to do the same thing where I just have Kim's back, and it just shuts the conversation down. Yes, like yeah. you and Kim just walk away and be like, oh, that guy's an asshole. But you never get any, you don't get any depth out of the ideological position mm-hmm. as to why the guy's being an asshole. It's just, oh, this guy's a racist asshole. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, but then you're finding out, right, that it's a bunch of these contradictory kind of like big pillar ideologies. And I think the commentary that the game is trying to make or the connection it's trying to make very clear is that, the, I mean, all of the things that he's saying are real world ideologies um, mm-hmm. that are very kind of surface level in, in the right wing. So um, anyway, so that's like bad or whatever. And um, Kim is like not on board with that, but that conversation is done. And then we're going to pick up cans or whatever. Sure. And then there's a dialogue specifically. And so sometimes Kim wants to talk to you and Mm. you get like a little um, like blinking dialogue thing on his portrait down the left of the screen. And so uh, I click on that and he's like, hey, like, 
he's basically giving you an out, right? He says, hey, um, when that guy was saying all that racist stuff, you were just trying to get information from him, right? You were just like entertaining him in order to like get in his good graces to, to pump him for information. And the game gives you an out to be like, yeah, uh, you know, I'm just being a cop. I'm just, you know, I'm lying to him so that I can learn more. It, and Or you can say, you know, I'm going to double down, basically. Mm. Uh, and it's like, well, he has a point. And so I like, I, you know, I click the well, he has a point. And then Kim says, well, like, no, he doesn't have a point. That's that's extremely, you know, it's ignorant. It it It's just all this ideology. It's not real, blah, blah, blah. And the game gives you two options. And one is like, yeah, you're right, Kim. And the other one is, well, actually. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Oh. And so so then I click on, well, actually. And the game actually explicitly says, it's like, you're really kind of going down this road. You know, you're getting this internal monologue from your character. From who? Like, you're really like, going down this road. Like, your, you, what part of your character is telling you that? Was that your mm, logic? Was that? Let me look. Give me, give me two seconds and let mm-hmm. me, let me, uh, I'll edit this out, but let me look. So the specifics here, I, I, mm-hmm. I pulled up my footage now. Yeah. Um, the specifics here is that rhetoric is the one that, that says like, oh, Kim is trying to like confront me about that. And, and Kim specifically says that, don't you think he, the way he phrases it to me is that, don't you think that this, these views are unbefitting to a police officer? Ooh. Right. And so I can say. Uh, maybe he's got a point. I can say it's not about me as police officers. We gain nothing by staking out the moral high ground. So we, I can kind of go for like the radical center. Um, <laughs> and uh, I can say, oh, he's actually just a product of of his environment, right? He's hmm. not entirely responsible for his views. I haven't been in this world for long. Maybe I'm a product of my environment too. Um, so you can basically go for like the radical center. You know, this guy is just a person who lives in the world or maybe he's got a point. Oh. And uh, rhetoric is what what responds to me and says, "Wait a second, are you sure you want to go there? Even if you succeed, you're going to fail." <laughs> so the game is really explicit here about like, tr- like defending racism to Kim Kitsuragi. Like is a what? Hu- yeah, huge like, mistake. Huge mistake. And like, it's it, the game is explicitly saying this ideology is bad. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so the game is stepping in pretty, pretty early, even though it's giving you these kind of options to, you know, be like a racist, uh, you know, jackass. Um, it's it's stepping in pretty explicitly to say, hey, you know, you probably don't want to do this. And, and explicitly, my two options here are what do you mean? I'm in the right here or on second thought, maybe I don't. So it's giving me an out. And of course, it's I giving you layers upon layers of outs. Yes. Mm hmm. Um, and then, uh, so I was like, yeah, I'm in the right. And, uh, the, then the game says, are you sure about that? Whoa. Mm -hmm. Number four. Uh, yeah. And so then, uh, I get a, basically the rhetorical ability to like present racism to Kim and I fail that. And, uh, my response and my dialogue option was, look, what, what happens when all the races get mixed up? So yeah, it uh even your that's your response after you fail to check, which I imagine there's no way to succeed that check, right? I don't know. I'm assuming that you probably can. Um mm. and, and maybe it's just because I mean I did this in the first hour of gameplay, so I hadn't leveled anything up, but mm-hmm. I don't think that there is anywhere in this game where like you just straight up can't make a check. But I think it was challenging. Um, mm. And so Kim says, "Hey, I'm going to stop this conversation." He makes a sudden hand gesture, an open palm. This is Martinet. People have certain attitudes here. You will find plenty of citizens to agree with you. As for me, oh, I gotta skip forward a little bit. I've had this conversation enough times in my life. From now on, I'm gonna stay out of it. How you choose to respond is your business. He concludes. Now, let's get back to the task at hand. So, Kim is very, both the game as a system, right? And Kim at this point are saying, you have the option to double down and be a racist jackass, but. It's not a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting the game is doing that here, and yet I'm going to have like 50 more opportunities to do it. And so I actually really wonder how this is going to, you know, will it just be the game repeatedly saying to me, this op- this entry level, are you sure you want to do that? Or is there going to be some sort of more complicated thing? And, and again, the reason I'm doing this and the reason I'm kind of going down this path is that the game, you know, they've designed this game with this as its own pathway, and I'm very interested in seeing like what that what the quote unquote in game 
of you know racist ideology looks like uh, in this game. Yeah, because uh, the game in making these choices, even in making the warnings, is making a choice. Because the, the game could also be designed where you select the racist option, and the game just says, "Actually, you don't say that. You yeah. say I'm sorry." Yeah. Like, or that is within like, the that is within the design capability of the game. A hundred percent, and within the ethos of the game, frankly, right? I mean, yeah. I, I wouldn't be shocked if that happened. Or I could take like huge morale hits. You know, like the, mm-hmm. there's you know a psychic. Um, you know, hit point system basically for this too. Notably, that that didn't happen, right? Like, there sure. are no choices here where I've like taken morale damage, um, and maybe that'll happen later on. But um, it it is also interesting to me too that this this entire conversation that I just talked about passed through rhetoric as its primary thing, right? Not a psyche ability, uh, mm. and that could just be because it's my key skill, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but um, or no. Uh, no, because uh, logic was my key skill. So I don't logic's know. your key chill skill, signature skill. But in choosing yeah. logic, you elevated the upper capacity of all of your intellect That's abilities. True. Mm-hmm. That's true. Um, so anyway, I don't know. That's a long thing to say. Uh, so I did that. I talked to the racist lorry driver, and he kind of gave me a little bit of uh, information about the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also talked to Joyce Messier, which we can talk about later. Yeah, but but uh, the so I was just walking around collecting cans because I wanted to buy my my raincoat, right? Mm-hmm. And she was just hanging out there, and so it's like a woman on a boat. And I talked to her, and she's like, "Hey, what's up?" Uh, you know, she says, "I work for uh, Wild Pines, mm-hmm. which is just like a like a company, and we're here uh, in order to figure out what's going on with this trade dispute. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're the cop, so maybe you can help us out here." And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe I can, you know, uh, let's let's put a pin in this and I'll come back later. And then I had an option, a dialogue option to say, you look really rich. Will you give me some money? <laughs> and then, like, I had this, like, tiered dialogue thing where it was like, you know, you're really going to have to debase yourself in order to, like, get this woman to give you money. This is another and, internal conversation of, like, do you really want to do this? Yeah. And I was like, I don't think it's debasing at all. I think I just, she seems rich and I would like her to give me some money. Mm-hmm. And so I, like, go back and forth and I think I made a check somewhere in there. And I just said... You know, at the end of this thing, which took probably three or four minutes of like dialogue, internal dialogue, I, mm-hmm. I literally said, "Will you please give me some money?" And she said, "Yeah, sure. How much money do you need?" And I said, "I need one hundred real." And she gave it to me. Oh my God! You have the you have the rent now. You <laughs> yeah, have the, so I got the, the rent. I was able to buy my raincoat too because I Dang. picked up enough cans. So you are Ticklevar is playing someone who views themselves as a very good cop. Mm-hmm. who is racist mm-hmm. and who has no filter. Well, it just has no no problem asking for things. No problem asking for and things. And I think it has to do with it. The way I'm thinking about it is that, you know, he's highly logical. She has some money. Mm-hmm. I need some money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It doesn't hurt to ask. Like, he doesn't have any problem asking, you know, directly for something. Yeah, which I guess also fits with you're also the type of person that is willing to defend racist nonsense to your uh, to your uh, kind of assigned partner. Yeah, um, who is obviously hurt by it. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. You just, uh, you know, like the facts matter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, that's all that matters. And obviously, we're that's going to produce some problems, I think, in the yeah. plot, in a general sense, both in the you know ideological sense, but also probably for uh, solving this crime. Yeah, I don't think that Balthazar is in that. I think Balthazar desperately cares about what people think about him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that Doubt Balthazar is probably uh, next episode going to have to. Uh, my electrochemistry is really has me hankering for a drink. I might have to go down that road. Yeah, my inexplicable feminist agenda, uh, after I completed it, it said that I have the possibility of turning that into a revolutionary feminist agenda, but uh, I would have to do drugs first. And it actually Whoa. lowered my electrochemistry by one. Game's going places. It's going places. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a long first episode, but just to be frank with people, I think probably every episode is going to be uh, closer to two hours than one hour. Yeah, just I think that frank. for whatever reason, it's just the the narrative density of this game suits it. it it's suitable to have 
fewer longer episodes than more shorter episodes. Yep. I think mm-hmm. that's the case. Yeah. Otherwise, I think we're just talking about like a couple of conversations per episode and that doesn't feel right. So we have started the game and we're going to, I think uh, next episode, we're going to uh, try to talk, interview some folks. Yeah. So next episode, we're going to learn a little bit about this union and we're going to do this kind of field autopsy. We're going to see what's actually going on with this corpse Um, and uh, try to figure out, we're trying to solve a murder here, y'all. Mm-hmm. Um, and in case people haven't figured this out, I guess we didn't say this at the beginning. The way that we have split out these episodes is we have basically some like big plot pillars that we're trying to hit every time and then just whatever side quests that we do. So some episodes might be a little bit more side quest focused and some might be a little bit more uh, main plot focused. Um, yeah. But we'll probably flag that as we go. There we go. Where can people find you? Oh, you can find out everything about everything at patreon.com slash range touch where you can support this show and all the other cool stuff we do you can listen to game study study buddies you can listen to too much future and watch too much future um and you can check out just king things uh you know range touch is a big network now of lots of cool critical projects where we're looking at books and media and other things of that nature and you can support that over at patreon.com slash range touch and also youtube.com slash range touch where you are probably checking this out this very moment but if you want it on a podcast feed, you can go down to the description below this episode and you can click a little link that'll take you right there. Yeah. And um, if you support it, you'll be a part of a of a huge social movement called the Thousandarium. The Thousandarium, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we are trying to get on Patreon, still probably when you're hearing this, we are trying to get to 1,000 supporters. So even if you can only chuck in $1 a month, that's perfectly fine. We're, we're just looking for 1,000 supporters. Um, that would really allow us to kind of grow and do some different cool stuff. Yeah, um, you don't all have to be wizard slayers. You can all be whatever the number one dollar is. Dirt the farmers. Head... <laughs> is that... You're going to have to change it on Patreon now. Maybe <laughs> don't. Maybe don't. That's maybe. I, maybe I wonder what maybe. it is. What is our one dollar? Is it a hedge I'll... wizard? It might be hedge wizard, yeah. But it, yeah. why isn't it dirt farmer? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what a huge mistake we made yeah. <laughs> all the way back when we put this together. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, in any case. Uh, and at $5 a month, you can get um, some really cool stuff, uh, such as the monthly podcast that Danny and I do, where we just kind of shoot the shit and talk about stuff. Uh, all the other media that we do. So, you know, uh, movies and TV and books that we're reading. And uh, you can also get episodes, bonus episodes of the Just King Things podcast at $5 a month. So, you know, basically we're asking you, please give us uh, one cup of coffee per month and uh, you get all kinds of cool benefits for it. And yeah, okay. Well, we'll be back in two weeks with the next episode of uh, Disco Elysium. We're going to learn about unions. Unions. Oh, it's going to be really interesting what uh, what a good cop thinks about unions and what Balthazar thinks about unions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, all right. Ciao.